En el centro de la pampa vive un pimiento Sol y viento pa' su vida, sol y viento Sol y viento pa' su vida, sol y viento Hello, I am Patrick Barnard, it's May 5th, 2023. This is the annual general meeting of the Green Coalition here in Montreal. It's going to be great fun. Bienvenue à la 165e édition du Piment, c'est l'Assemblée Générale Annuelle de la Coalition Verte Montréal. Ah, c'est intéressant. Charlie, uh, you've been uh, the president here for at least a year now. How do you see this year that's gone by? Well, there's been a lot of movement and a lot of avenues, uh, especially with the uh, Grand Park of the West. It's looking very good. Uh, the creation of uh, the new park in Mill Hill, 43 kilometers, are protected. Uh, there's still challenges, obviously, like the Techno Park, which we're still working actively to lobby for its protection. Um, we've expanded our region right across uh, Quebec into the Laurentians and goodness knows where else at this point. Alors, Charlie, si j'ai bien compris, euh, tu penses que c'était une bonne année pour la coalition? Au père pour euh, la coalition, depuis oui. les 35 années qui euh, en existe, cette année, c'est mieux que les autres, je pense. Oui. Formidable, formidable. Alors, euh, le progrès, c'est possible. Le progrès, c'est possible. <rire> Merci, Charlie. Rien. Gareth, um, you were the president of the Green Coalition. You've seen the last year in action. What do you think uh, this year has been like, this past year? Uh, well, it's been uh, quite busy for the coalition, I think. There's been a number of issues. And, uh, Charlie has uh, taken the helm as, as president and uh, done a very good job, I think. And uh, what are the high points of this year as far as the environment is concerned for you? Oh, uh, earlier this year, the, um, the big park announcement for uh, Midier de Millil, that was very significant. I know there are ongoing talks, but apparently there are ongoing talks about a national urban park for Montreal. That could be quite something if it happens. Right. Do you think there's a greater consciousness now here in this city, realistically? I think, uh, I mean, our administration, uh, led by uh, Mayor Plant, does seem to be much more aware of the environment than any, any other administration I can remember. Um, I guess they they have constraints. It's a question of whether they're able to work within those constraints to, to, to deliver what I think they really want to deliver. Hi, Elizabeth May here, and I know it's a pretty boring background, but I just stepped outside of the chamber to send a video message because I really wish I could be with you all. I love working with the Green Coalition, and I'm really inspired by your persistence and your dedication and your commitment. I started, I started knowing about the Green Coalition, I can't even remember how many years ago, but specifically, I really appreciated that in, uh, in 2019, it got me out to Techno Park, so we could actually see the incredible habitat and the endangered species and the birds in that area. And I've worked and watched as you've expanded your reach and done more and now doing work right pretty much across all of Montreal, all of, well, not just Montreal, Island, but all of Quebec. Pretty impressive work, and I'm very grateful. And particularly, uh, I want to thank you for putting together, you know, that we were all were able to pull together during the Biodiversity Convention in Montreal, COP15 in December of last year. Just great to be able to work with Clifford Lincoln again. What a joy, and be able to call out the Liberal federal government that right here with the world gathering for the Kung Ming Montreal commitment to biodiversity and right, you know, a stone's throw away, the bulldozers can destroy critical habitat and nobody lifts a finger. So here's to you, Green Coalition. Uh, again, I'm, I'm honored to work with you always and uh, I look forward to the next time that we get up to, get up to mischief together and try to make a difference in this world. Everybody together, pulling together at all times, indigenous, settler culture, Quebecois, the rest of Canada, Mother Earth demands that we do more. And I 
love working with you. Thanks. Monsieur Clifford Lincoln, vous êtes ici pour l'Assemblée Générale de, de la Coalition Verte, c'est fantastique. Euh, D'après vous, quelle est la situation des espaces naturels sur l'île de Montréal maintenant? Parce que vous avez beaucoup d'expérience. Ben, je pense que c'est une euh, bataille continuelle. Hein. Euh, on ne peut jamais rien prendre pour acquis. Euh, comme vous savez, la coalition verte a eu des succès remarquables. Hein, le, le grand pas de l'Ouest, grand salon, etc., etc. Mais tout de même, c'est toujours une bataille à recommencer. Là, par exemple, nous prenons les, les, les cas comme celui du Technoparc, qui, pour vous et moi, on, on prend ça pour acquis que ça devrait être préservé. Voilà un écosystème euh, précieux entre tous, euh, en pleine ville, qui serait facile de préserver parce qu'elle appartient à la, pour, pour la grosse majorité à un seul propriétaire. Mais regardez la bataille que nous avons. Oui. Pour... Alors, c'est toujours euh, une question de, pour l'environnement de se placer euh, en importance dans le niveau. Ce qui est très difficile parce que l'économie, le, la, la finance, euh, les affaires prédominent toujours électoralement. Ah, vous avez beaucoup d'expérience. J'aimerais vous poser cette question. Dans le cas du, du Technoparc, le gouvernement du Canada, par euh, Transport Canada, est le propriétaire de à peu près 155 hectares. Quelle est la raison, euh, la raison pour l'immobilité du fédéral dans ce cas, pensez-vous? Écoutez, le, le, le fédéral a cédé euh, le, la gérance à l'aéroport euh, de Montréal et il faudrait une volonté politique pour le gouvernement fédéral de s'imposer envers le, le locataire. Mais il est clair que le fédéral ne veut pas le faire parce que ça demanderait, euh, ça demanderait une, un pouvoir politique à renforcer euh, que le fédéral, euh, de toute évidence, ne veut pas euh, le faire. Alors ce qui arrive, c'est que, que justement, il y a le, le, la réponse de Montréal se sent tout puissant, le fédéral ne veut pas intervenir et alors ça va rester malheureusement dans leurs mains. Campbell Stewart of the Legacy Fund for the Environment, how do you assess this past year in terms of Montreal and its natural environment? Um, really, I think it goes both ways. There is a lot of destruction happening. A lot of people are digging in their heels because they got money to make out of it. Uh, you think of uh, Fairview Forest and any number of other places, and they've got municipal allies. On the other hand, it's really clear to me uh, from the work that we do with citizens groups is that citizens groups are getting stronger and they're getting smarter and they're starting to turn the tide. And I think that the, the model of both the Legacy Fund and the Green Coalition, which is to unite citizens groups, uh, working grassroots, um, is really beginning to pay off. So I'm, I'm really, really optimistic, not that we're going to solve all the problems now, but I think we're building a small army. Here we are at an AGM. You and I have talked to one of these before. Yes. Um, uh, seriously, what, what did you see in the past year? in terms of the environment. What's your assessment, your quick assessment? Well, the quick assessment is that there's a, um, you know, there's an awareness that's growing, for sure. And people are not taking anything for granted anymore. And they're standing up for their rights to have a clean, healthy environment. Meanwhile, um, unfortunately, the development side of things has been followed. So they're still progressing with development and and destroying natural spaces, which is what we need more than ever now. So I think the two now, it's like an arms race, and hopefully, you know, we'll come together and start discussing on how we can really save these natural spaces. That's so it's, bo it's both things at once. Greater yeah. consciousness, the importance of the environment, and greater pressure upon it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which is a good thing. I think people are feeling empowered. Um, they know they can do something about it. And uh, but you know, it's gonna, it's going to take some time, and it's going to take perseverance. For sure. Thank you. Thank you.
What you're saying uh, is very similar to what Isabel told me about 10 minutes ago. Uh, so it appears that it really is happening, this, this small, perhaps not so small tide. I think, I think that because it's very diffuse, um, because we, we don't have sort of a grand uh, umbrella for everybody, we're really relying on different groups to, to do local work. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the, the whole thing, but sitting where we do, where we get the reports, where we provide the funding and the, and the support, and, you know, with the Green Coalition does the same thing, um, that really is paying off. That really is. And what do you think is the priority in Montreal for the coming year, in your view? Uh, well, if I had my way, I'd say adopt the Green Charter. Montreal needs to adopt the Green Charter. The island of Montreal should stop building on green spaces, period. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't stop everything on green spaces, then it's going to get nibbled away. Everybody knows what Zeno's paradox is, you do end up with nothing. And is the Legacy Fund going to be involved with that this year? Oh, more than ever. More than ever. The, the, the number of citizens groups we have, the amount of, uh, of funding we're giving out, the, the, the spread and the geographic spread of what we're doing is, uh, uh, is it's a bit of a wild horse to ride. Okay. Very good. Congratulations. Thank you. The Green Coalition has recently lost a dear friend, and I'd like to invite our founder and vice president, David Fletcher, to come up and say a few words on his behalf. I'd like to start by saying that you know, the Green Coalition has had a, a very serious loss uh, recently, just over the last month. Uh, a person who's been a rock upon which uh, the organization has been founded and in fact was the husband of the Green Coalition's founder, Sylvia Olgemeyer. I'm speaking about Harry Olgemeyer. Um, he was struck down a year, exactly a year ago. Uh, he had COVID. He was having difficulty with movement at the time. And uh, of course, uh, as he became more and more immobile, couldn't get up to the upper story in the two-story house. Uh, you know, uh, it became very difficult for Sylvia, and so she had to move him into into care. And uh, he progressively declined, and eventually uh, submitted. It's a great loss to me personally. I've known Harry since 1988. Uh, to me, he was a bit of a rock too, because when you were feeling down, Harry could always come up with that quip. That naughty little quip that would make you laugh. Um, I'm sure he kept Sylvia's spirits up too. I don't think it was always easy for him. Uh, you know, with all that Sylvia's done, uh, with all of the work that she undertook for the Green Coalition, uh, he had to bear the loss of Sylvia's time. But he was always there, as I said. He was a happy guy. He was an outdoorsman, just like Sylvia was. They got out into, uh, into nature, and, and that's what brought them to the cause, in fact. And so, you know, to me, uh, it's a great loss. I don't know, for you that knew Harry, I'm sure you find it uh, a loss that's hard to bear as well. Uh, for you that have spoken to him and had uh, contact with Harry, uh, you know, uh, there's a gap now, there's a hole in the Green Coalition. He was never on our board, he never served as, a, a, an, as an officer, but he was always there to support, always there to uphold the, the founder. And that's, that's, to me, a role that is very, very important. So I say to Harry, you know, I'm, I'm uh, if, if Harry can hear me anywhere, uh, you know, I'm only a few years behind you, Harry, and I'll be heading your way soon. And I'll be looking forward to hearing some more of your jokes. <laughs> um, with that, um, maybe just a moment to think about Harry, and, and, uh, and then we'll go on with the meeting. My name is Louise Legault. I'm a member of the Conseil. I couldn't laisser passer le 35e anniversaire euh, de la coalition sans faire un petit mot là-dessus. Et euh, en parlant à Sylvia, justement, euh, j'ai découvert que euh, la coalition verte, 
a commencé avec, justement, 13 groupes qui ont organisé la journée verte. OK? Alors, c'est vous dire l'importance des groupes euh, au, sein de, au sein de la coalition. Je vais vous ramener au 14 mai 1988, peut-être. Ah, oui! <rire> um, où est-ce que ces 13 groupes-là se sont, euh, ont réuni 3000 personnes au bois de Liesse. Ils, ils avaient loué des autobus, il y avait de la musique, et il y avait même le maire de Dorval qui, lui, était arrivé avec ses grilles pour faire des hot dogs. Okay? Euh, David, ici, euh, faisait des visites guidées du bois de Liesse. Et l'invité le, 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 d'honneur était Frédéric Bach, le cinéaste et euh, peintre. Alors, euh, le bois de l'IS, à ce moment-là, était déjà scindé par euh, le chemin de fer. Euh, mais là, en plus, il était menacé par le groupe Grilly, qui voulait y construire, comme on sait, des condos. Et il y avait aussi euh, un projet d'autoroute. Alors, les citoyens ont clairement demandé à la CUM, à ce moment-là, euh, « On veut avoir un programme. » qui va permettre de protéger les espaces verts qui restent, parce qu'on en a de moins en moins. Ils ont réussi. Ils ont réussi parce que deux ans plus tard, il y avait 200 millions sur la table. Là, je ne vous donne pas le reste de l'histoire parce que ça, vous allez pleurer, mais il y avait à ce moment-là 200 millions sur la table pour l'acquisition de terrain. Puis le bois de liesse, ben, lui, il est toujours là. Alors, c'est vous dire la force du nombre. So, uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the, the coalition Terrain Golf en Transition. Um, I, I founded the, the coalition uh, for, uh, three years ago uh, after joining my local citizen uh, group, which was uh, uh, les résidents, uh, le regroupement des résidents de Candiac who was uh, trying to preserve the last a green space of importance in my city, Candiac. And uh, after all that, I decided to, uh, to fund the, uh, the Coalition Terrain Golf en Transition. And um, now it regroups 20 citizen groups. Um, and we have a, a Facebook group and we are followed by more than 200 people. So our mission uh, is to create a network of groups with common issues for mutual help and to lead actions to convince government above municipality level. So we're talking about MRCs, uh, Communauté Métropolitaine de Montréal, and Government of Quebec to preserve the Gulf green spaces, to restore them to higher ecological value, and to make them public parks accessible to all. So we have different kind of actions, and the first kind is to um, the first type of action is to mobilize citizens to ask um, the Quebec government to modify the expropriation law. Uh, we had two petition on the site of the National Assembly already to ask for the modernization of this law. These are petition are closed now. We now have currently an email campaign uh, addressed at the PM Legault and his cabinet and asking again for the modification of this law and also to grant the uh, 100 million um, to the CMM. The CMM is asking for that money to buy the goals and to restore them to higher ecological value. Uh, we also take uh, actions uh, uh, directly uh, lobbying the CMM to impose moratorium on construction projects on golfs, and we we lobbied them so much, and we <laughs> we went uh, we asked them questions, and we sent them letters, and they finally uh, created the the règlement de contrôle intérimaire (RCI) on six goals of the CMM in June 2020. Uh, ce règlement de contrôle intérimaire uh, bloque le développement uh, en, attend, uh, en attendant que le nouveau plan de métropolitain d'aménagement et développement soit écrit. Donc, jusqu'en 2025, le, le, le nouveau uh, PMAD 
euh, et, et du pour 2025. Oui, bonjour. Alors, je suis une physicienne à la retraite qui est devenue une activiste contre les déchets radioactifs. D'accord? Um, I have prepared information sheet to summarize the, the drama of radioactive waste in Canada. So, a short history. So, they are copy in French and in English. Okay? So, like that. Okay? I will mainly talk about this one. The hot subject right now. Okay, and the other one is the radioactive waste drama in Canada. So you can pick a copy if you want. And there is one sheet also about the flaw of the recent nuclear policy in Canada. Okay, so I started when they wanted to reopen the mine in Oka. Okay, je vis à Oka. Uh, because this mine, uh, this is niobium, but uh, there is a lot of radioactivity associated with niobium. So when I heard that they wanted to reopen the mine, I said, oh gee, I will sell my house. I don't want to stay there. But I decided to fight with other, and we succeed. But we never know for the future, okay? So after people from Ontario came and asked me to help them with uh, Chuck River, and Port Hope, and other place in Canada, so I got busy every day of the week <laughs> doing that. Okay, so I will make a summary. This year, the Canadian government, the Ministry of Natural Affairs, has published the new policy about radioactive waste. Okay, about 250 organizations were consulted but not listened to. Not at all. Okay, so it is a big flaw. And this is a lack of democracy. Okay? Because we did serious study. Myself, I did a report to the Auditor General of Canada. You no, know, like a hundred page of uh, proof. And uh, I participated in this policy. I give conference to people from Europe so that they see the other side in Canada. And they just don't want to listen because the nuclear lobby is too strong. Okay, so one of our recommendations was no nuclear waste near body of water. No importation of waste from foreign country. Can you imagine that? Okay, Canada re-import about 98% of the radioisotopes used for, the med for medical health. Okay, they all come back to Canada and then we are stuck with this garbage like cobalt-60, okay? Very dangerous. Uh, they also use, um, use no nuclear uh, fuel to extract plutonium. So plutonium, c'est le déchet maudit dans le nucléaire. Very easy to make a bomb with that. So they want to do that again, okay? So Canada signed an agreement to forbid the proliferation of nuclear uh, arm. Weapons. Okay. Weapons. Uh, we, yes, weapons, thank you. <laughs> and they don't respect their agreement, okay? They want to extract plutonium again mm -hmm. and New Brunswick, okay? So this is terrible. So this policy was a big flaw. Why, okay? The main reason it's because the Ministry of Natural Resource has a double mandate. Develop the nuclear and manage the waste. What do you think they do? They don't care about the nuclear waste. Okay, we have millions of tons in Canada and they don't care. They don't do anything. There is not a single installation to isolate the nuclear waste permanently from the biosphere, because we cannot destroy the nuclear waste. We have to wait millions of years sometime that it will disintegrate. There is not a single permanent installation in Canada, okay? So it's terrible. One minute, okay. Now, the hot subject is the small modular reactor. This is the big fashion now. We are against it because it will generate even more dangerous waste 
They cannot put anywhere because they are associated with salt, so very reactive. They cannot put it in a deep repository because it will create a reaction. Okay, so they want to do that and everybody say, okay, okay, okay. So do not hesitate to write a letter to boost a little bit the Minister Gilbo of Environment because he seems to have forgot his roots. Okay, because us, we want that the Ministry of Environment in charge of the nuclear waste. We don't want to have this dual mandate, okay? So it should be the good minister for that, okay? So the rest, I, I, I cannot talk because my time is out. <laughs> but I encourage you, okay, to look at the sheet. This is a summary. This is the essence of what is happening in Canada. And do not hesitate to write to the MP, to write to the minister. I spent last week in Ottawa meeting MP. Okay? So do not hesitate to write to them. They need uh, to shovel their feather a little bit. <laughs> um, oui, la group, uh, le nom est la Co Coalition pour les quartiers verts et pays paisibles which is the Coalition for Green and Quiet Neighborhoods, and we go by the acronym QVP. Our mission is to advocate, which is our, what was in our title, uh, for green and quiet neighborhoods, or for, uh, promouvoir pour les quartiers verts et paisibles, and specifically to ban gas-powered leaf blowers on the island of Montreal. Pour interdire des souffleurs de l'essence à, 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 I'm sorry, des souffleurs à feuilles à l'essence sur la ville de Montréal. The group, uh, we're about eight on our steering committee and many, many more on our supporter list. We come at the moment from NDG, Bill Marie, and Westmount. Initially, those of us that joined the group was because of the noise of a leaf blower, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, that was the primary issue for those of us who joined. But uh, we soon learned really that the major issue is environmental. The pollution is harmful to, in particular, insects and, of course, people. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions are there and leaf removal, uh, which has many, many consequences. Uh, for this last year, 2022-23, um, we have been doing several things. First of all, documenting the leaf blower bylaws that are in the, at the moment now, for the 19 boroughs of Montreal. And later, then, we hope to look at the various other municipalities, towns, and cities on the island of Montreal. The next step we're looking at is educating homeowners and the landscapers so that they know about the bylaw. And thirdly, we're checking on the practices in terms of compliance. Um, with respect to the large institutions like McGill, Concordia, schools and hospitals in NDG and asking to see their landscaping contracts through access to information. So that's proving interesting. And the next thing that we've gotten into, because it's very related, is the leaf management in terms of educating people about the importance of leaves and that they are a resource, uh, not garbage to be put in bags or paper bags to be collected, um, but it's, they're very much part of the environment and the cycle of our environment. So we're, we're seeing that we need to do a lot with that too, so people understand. I'm the co-founder of the Regroupement Eco Citoyen of St. Marthe sur le Lac. It's at this title that I'm a member of Mar, the Mar, so the Mouvement d'Action Régionale en Environnement, and then I'm invited to be part of the Coalition Verte. I feel like I'm a bit of a trait d'union between the Mar and the Coalition Verte. Et, euh, simplement pour vous donner un peu l'état de la situation, il y, a, il y a les claims miniers aussi dans les Laurentides, graves problématiques où la législation pour les claims miniers a préséance sur la législation sur l'aménagement du territoire. Donc, ce sont les, les mines qui, euh, donc, euh, qui, 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 qui ont préséance. Donc, c'est il y a énormément à cause de l'électrification des transports, tout ça, il y a énormément de demandes. Donc c'est un dossier que, qui pourrait être intéressant, qu'on se penche au niveau de la coalition verte. Il y a aussi une grave problématique d'un dépotoir à Kanasataki où euh, David, euh, 
Charlie et moi, on a assisté à une rencontre euh, la semaine dernière euh, où euh, il y a deux, euh, deux militantes là, de OCA qui nous présentaient la grave problématique de violence qu'il y a aussi au niveau du, de la communauté euh, de Kanesatake et puis euh, du danger pour les enfants, de l'inquiétude de les laisser jouer dehors. Il y, a, il, y a, il y a quelque chose de très violent qui se passe là-bas. Donc le dépotoir de Kanesatake, c'est aussi... Là, euh, une grave problématique là, de contamination. Euh, et j'en viens à la Grande Tourbière de Blainville. Donc, euh, euh, comme citoyenne, j'ai été, il y a quelques mois, j'ai euh, vu euh, passer cette, cette euh, sauvegardons la Grande Tourbière de Blainville. J'avais écrit euh, à un des membres et je n'avais pas eu de nouvelles, mais il y a deux semaines environ, on a, on a euh, reçu... Euh, un appel euh, d'aide, un appel à l'aide des citoyens qui euh, se préparent pour la tenue du BAP, donc qui va débuter le 9 mai. Euh, Stablex, c'est une usine d'enfouissement de déchets contaminés euh, qui existe depuis les années 80. Euh, on stabilise des déchets, il y a même des déchets qu'on reçoit des États-Unis, 30% des déchets que nous recevons des États-Unis, 10% d'ailleurs au Canada. On en est, euh, Stablex est une usine américaine qui est venue s'installer au Québec parce que la législation québécoise est plus, euh, euh, je dirais, euh, souple. Alors, euh, donc, euh, c'est ça. Donc, euh, tout le conseil d'administration, sauf une personne, est composé de, 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 de membres qui viennent de l'Arizona. D'abord, pour la construction, il va y avoir destruction de 50 à 60 hectares de milieux naturels. Euh, 9 hectares de milieu humide et on va, euh, ça je ne peux pas vous en parler davantage, mais je vais connaître mieux le dossier, mais atteinte à la tourbière euh, pour soutenir le fonds d'héritage en environnement qui vient énormément en aide aux citoyens. Pas tout de suite parce que mon mois de mai est super occupé, mais en allant plus tard, j'aimerais ça fonder une équipe pour organiser euh, une grosse levée de fonds qui circulerait au travers du Québec, à travers tous les organismes environnementaux. Euh, Fondation David Suzuki, euh, les, 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 grands, les grands organismes et, et les plus petits, pour faire connaître l'importance de l'implication citoyenne et la problématique que les citoyens ont de défendre les milieux naturels et d'ensuite d'être obligés de, 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 de faire des levées de fonds. Puis, fait, ça serait le fun si on pouvait faire une grosse levée de fonds. Puis à ce moment-là, euh, euh, pour. Euh, en tout cas, c'est ça. Je suis déjà en contact avec Jason. Euh, puis on, on essaie là, de. J'ai commencé à explorer un peu la plateforme Zephi. Donc on pourrait, là, s'il si y a des gens qui sont intéressés ici ce soir à travailler là-dessus, moi je pense qu'on pourrait faire quelque chose de très intéressant de façon annuelle, euh, une grosse levée de fonds. Pour, puis, puis de parler aussi de l'implication citoyenne. Puis de, des, des, la cause là, de, 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 que les citoyens défendent. Vivi Forest is a beautiful and biodiverse place. It is also the last untouched natural space in the area, which hosts a large shopping mall and residential area opposite it. It is a home to exceptional flora and fauna such as the brown snake, migrating birds and butterflies, a rare hemlock and beech grove, and two vernal ponds. Um, next slide, please. Over 20 acres of the forest have trees that are at least um, 115 years old. For neighboring residents, the much loved forest acts as a buffer from the air and noise pollution from Highway 40, as well as the future run right beside it. It also helps prevent flooding by absorbing excess rain and provides shade and cooler temperatures in extreme heat. Um, slide please. Thank you. So Save Fairy Forest has been working hard to meet its goal of saving 100% of the forest from the start doing everything possible to put the issue in the, in the public eye and pressure the different levels of government to take any action possible to stop Catholic Fairview's plants. Since shortly after the uh, inception of Save Heavy Forest, we have been protesting every Saturday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. right by the forest, regardless of rain or sleet or snow or freezing or absolutely roast, roasting temperatures. Um, actually, uh, this past, actually, this past October 2022, we celebrated our 100th continuous protest And tomorrow, Saturday, uh, will be our 128th straight day protest without interruption is illustrating our determination. 
We have, of course, engaged in more types of action than our weekly protests. Our members have gone to countless Point Claire Council meetings, done a great, done a great number of media interviews, spoken to officials, and in, in, in innumerable emails, sent out newsletters to our supporters regularly, as well as posted about the forest and related issues in our Facebook group, Facebook group which you see here, uh, which I encourage you to join. Should you wish, of course, to join Fairview Forest as a member beyond, uh, and beyond just joining our Facebook group, uh, Jen over there in the corner, who's waving her hand, has some membership um, membership forms for you. We'll be overjoyed to discuss a group and any questions you may have. Of course, uh, located on the on the Sheen and Cote Saint Luke, half and half, and it borders Montreal West, which is then close to NDG. Uh, we've been going for about 33 plus years now, 34 this summer, almost as old as the Green Coalition. And uh, our mission uh, is to have an urban nature park, which is 57 hectares there, where the golf course is located, and to be part of a green network connecting further south and, and north, east, west, wherever. Um, so we've uh, been fortunate that in 2015, the zonage was actually changed to Vail Recreative from uh, housing. So at least it's safe for now, that part. And uh, our goal is to have the city purchase it, of course, but uh, negotiations are being held up because the landowner, um, developer Group Pacific, is challenging the 2015 Shema change to green. So meanwhile, we still keep busy. We meet every month for a very uh, dedicated long-term uh, steering committee and having new members join us from year to year, which is nice. Um, we have kept ourselves busy this past year, I would say, with uh, working on a, we're working on a children's book uh, regarding Meadowbrook. And uh, last June, we had an interesting um, presentation. One of our steering committee members is a law professor at McGill, and she suggested having her students do a project on golf courses in transition and the Expropriation Act. So uh, I'm here to tell you how we transformed a city from a pro-development nightmare into an environmentally friendly utopia. <laughs> our city now recognizes the importance of protecting our natural environments, preserving them for the well-being of all, for a good quality of air, water, soils, for the conservation of biodiversity, as well as a resource for the citizens of Pancor. But. This was not always the case. Five years ago, uh, I was here giving my first presentation at a Green Coalition AGM, desperately asking for help to save Russo Forest, a 4.2 hectare wetland that the city called Place Pierre Brunet, the future site of 45 homes. Many citizens we approached told us we were wasting our time. You can't fight City Hall. Our pro-development mayor and council treated us with contempt and deliberately hid information from us. But we did not give up. We went to every city council meeting. We distributed cards to every house in the area. We set up a Facebook page. We hired a lawyer. Campbell, in fact, to get the documents we needed and to send a mise en demeure to the city when we spotted an excavator in the forest. We held a concert fundraiser to raise awareness and a few dollars. We hired a biologist, Isabel, where is she? She's, she left. Okay. Um, we hired a biologist to take an environmental inventory. We challenged the developer's environmental assessment and the certificate of authorization. Thinking to discredit our biologist, the city hired its own biologist who found even more valuable species and more vernal pools in the forest than we had. Long story short, in 2020, the city agreed to buy back the forest from the developer pending the results of a referendum on a borrowing bylaw. Citizens of Pancor voted in favor of paying $35 a year more in taxes to buy the forest from the developers. But 
Unfortunately, our pro-development administration imposed a special tax on the 90 families living beside the forest, raising their taxes over $500 a year. By so doing, they thought they would discourage any other citizen efforts to save our few remaining underdeveloped areas or undeveloped areas. Clearly, they had no understanding of the value of a natural park for the entire city, nor did they understand how fed up citizens were with the irresponsible development of what was once a beautifully forested city. The pro-development mayor had to go. So, I ran for municipal councillor in the 2021 election on a green ticket. And I took on a powerful incumbent who had presided over the destruction of an important wetland in his district and had somehow misappropriated funds that were supposed to be spent on a sewage treatment plant, which is to this day still stinking on the hot days of summer. Long story short, I lost by 12 votes, not bad for my first kick at the can, rattled a lot of cages in City Hall in the process, and more to the point, the pro-development incumbent mayor also lost. And that's how Pancour Vert became an environmentally friendly city. Next slide, please. Carol Reed of Pancor Vert, our city councillor, uh, Denise Bergeron, uh, another city councillor, um, Claudine and Diane, and uh, Sheila, part of Pancor Vert, and Steve Perry with Lily, the Pancor Vert pod. So my message to you is, last slide please, have courage. You can do it. No matter how difficult your work is, no matter how discouraged you sometimes feel, don't give up. We are the change, and we will make it happen. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Announce for the first time the creation of GardenCrescentGreen.org. Um, we are going to try to save a stand of trees. There are about 25 poplar cottonwood trees located in the Garden Crescent here in Dorval. Unfortunately, uh, Garden Crescent sits at the bottom, or the base if you will, of a very, very large heat island which runs from the north side of Dorval Airport and now all the way down to Dawson Avenue in Dorval. They are now eyeballing this piece of territory and that would extend this heat island all the way down to the lake shore, less about 150 yards. That would essentially cut off one side of Dorval from the other. So, Garden Crescent Green Croissant Garden Verte has been registered and uh, we are uh, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, of course at our website. Our mission is to support through peaceful, nonpartisan, and democratic demonstrations the preservation of the trees located in the Garden Crescent and to promote sustainable land use in our community. Uh, the encroaching heat island is probably the most important uh, aspect of this struggle as well in parallel at the same time with the quality of life of people who are presently living in the Garden Crescent. Any, uh, any sort of development uh, that would happen there would literally ruin their lives and probably drive their rents up through the roof. Um, we're suffering now in uh, Dorval, especially in the area in question, with the loss of a lot of trees, especially canopy trees. And the trees that are in question here in the, door, in the Garden Crescent are canopy trees. Uh, what can I say? Um, the, the emerald ash borer has just destroyed uh, probably up to uh, 25 or 30% of the trees in that area. 
Uh, we will have some events coming up. I want to create a uh, media event. We'll be holding a round table for citizens. Uh, I want to know what the people who live in the Garden Crescent want to see done. This is a beautiful piece of land that would make an incredible park. It, I mean, it's just, you look at it and right away you're going to say to yourself, parkland. So this is an opportunity for the city of Dorval to do a 180 and then help us to, to save this space. Ça, c'est une association qui a été formée il y a quelques années <coughs> parce qu'on réalisait que le lac était sur une réserve scout de Tamaracuta. Ça, ici, il y a même des personnes ici qui sont là, de, qui ont des maisons là depuis 1940. Puis, il y a quelques maisons, on est 15 adresses, 15 adresses. Puis, euh, ce qui arrive, c'est que le camp scout Tamaracuta, qui euh, est en existence depuis 1912, c'est avant qu'il ferme, il y a quelques années, là, c'était le plus vieux camp qui fonctionnait au monde. Parce qu'en Angleterre, il y en avait eu un en 1897, je crois, mais ça a fermé pendant la guerre. Et ici au Canada, en 1912, le camp a été euh, ouvert. C'est un vieux camp. C'est une réserve faunique, puis une réserve qui est très riche en milieu, uh, in wetlands, in uh, diverse forests. Actually, the first thing I want to talk just a little bit is Charlie McLeod, because he's, <laughs> because way back in 2013, uh, I was living there. We bought a house because we're, my husband and I are scouts, and we wanted to retire and have a place to uh, have fun, to volunteer. And then shortly after, the, the camp closed. So, but in the meantime, Charlie, who was part of the coalition, I think, maybe not president, but he had done a research here. I have, and he did it with uh, many people, project partners, research partners to uh, to uh, wetlands include marsh grassland riparian marsh forested swamp a, a beautiful moderately high they call it there's a bog there with herons and the aquatic birds and it's a thousand acre i believe that it's organizations like this one it's people who are in the environment uh, for which they are uh, working to uh, to conserve <coughs> Uh, people who go outside, who put their boots on, who take walks in nature, who talk about it, who, who talk on behalf of nature to the people that are making the decisions, and in fact everybody around them, who remind children that it's important to go and play outside. These are the people who are truly making a difference, and if we have a chance of saving the world, uh, I believe that this is our chance. It's not through technology. It's really not. It's through our direct connection to nature. C'est pourquoi la cause de la coalition verte est tellement importante pour nous tous. Parce que la coalition verte représente la persistance, la durée du travail, la, la cause noble qu'on ne lâche pas, qu'on continue à défendre jour en jour, sans jamais arrêter. Aussi, euh, j'encourage, je travaille beaucoup dans les activités de la municipalité, j'encourage l'entraide et particulièrement l'implication des jeunes, parce que c'est bien beau, mais je me regarde tout ici, puis on a besoin de jeunes relèves. Même s'il y en a moins, si on les implique jeunes, c'est là que ça commence. Euh, maintenant aussi, grâce à Charlie, qui est ici, j'ai appris sur les fragmites, qui est une plante invasive, qui j'appelle une méchante plante. Et c'est rendu un fléau, et au camp du coup que Céline mentionnait tout à l'heure, Céline d'ailleurs m'a aidé avec Charlie depuis deux ans qu'on s'occupe de contrôler les fragments là-bas. Par contre, là, il va falloir y retourner, parce que là, maintenant, sur la plage, il y en a. La plage, on sait que des fragments et de l'eau, ça ne va pas bien ensemble. Ça prolifie, ça, ça pousse en autre fenêtre. Donc là, je suis fière de dire que la municipalité de Mélile a décidé de se commettre finalement cette année, après deux ans d'harcèlement, comme quoi que maintenant ils vont élargir la renouée du Japon, la sensibilisation à la renouée du Japon, à toutes les plantes invasives, pour inclure la fragmite. 
Donc, en incluant la phragmite, bien là, on va pouvoir plus travailler sur ce sujet-là, sur ces plantes-là. Puis moi, mon but premier, c'est d'apprendre à sensibiliser le monde. Donc, c'est ce que Mélide va faire en passant cet été. On sensibilise, on va éduquer, on commence par le début. Mais par contre, moi, l'idée, ça serait de pousser ça, puis de rendre tous les citoyens responsables des phragmites sur leur terrain. Comme ça, on a juste à s'occuper de ça sur les routes. Et la manière de faire ça, moi, j'étais prête à partir cette année. C'est toujours une petite municipalité de 15 cents à se passer de budget. Mais l'idée, c'est de faire des concours de photos. Puis moi, je voulais faire ça même par les jeunes. Que les jeunes envoient des photos de plantes envahissantes et les plus belles photos vont gagner. Puis je, je vous le jure, mon mari ne connaissait pas les fragmites. On l'a amené de pleine et misère pour une journée. Or, il y en a eu assez pour sa journée de s'occuper de ça. Par contre, à ce jour, il n'y est pas tout. Il les voit tout partout, il est, il est frustré, etc. Donc, mon point, c'est quand on connaît, on a côtoyé une situation, après ça, on la comprend mieux pour s'implique beaucoup plus. Donc, c'est un petit peu ma, ma situation euh, présentement. Donc, euh, je suis occupée à faire ça, je travaille fort et puis euh, je remercie Charlie, parce que c'est Charlie qui m'a parti là-dessus. Pas de Charlie, moi, je serai assez euh, chez nous. Et puis, euh, merci à vous tous parce que je m'écoute l'année et puis je suis une pinote à comparer de ce que vous faites. I was mentioning the, um, the little fundraising concert we did out uh, for Pank Faubert for Russo Forest. And uh, being a former musician, and still sometimes a musician, um, I invited one of my buddies to uh, go out and do a show with me with some other musicians. Uh, and then uh, last year he did the same thing for the fundraiser for the Legacy Fund for the Environment, and it was his last concert. Uh, his name is John McGale, and you may know him. Uh, he was uh, one of the most famous musicians in Quebec with one of the most famous bands, uh, Offenbach. And shortly after that concert, he passed away in a tragic car accident. We had a, I had a, I, I'm missing a very dear friend, and so was the Green Coalition because he was ready to come on board again. So uh, my heart goes out to him. I hate to end on a sad note. <laughs> But thank you all for coming. Any of the member groups, the new ones coming here, if you have any questions that we didn't cover tonight, please don't hesitate to contact us. Uh, we'll follow up on everything. I'd like to thank Clifford Lincoln again for coming. McIntyre. Elizabeth May, who was on board with us even though she couldn't be here tonight. And on that note, um, yeah. thank you all so much for coming. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next year. And call us anytime. Thank you. David Fletcher. Uh, here we are, the Green Coalition once again. Uh, how would you assess the last year in Montreal as far as the environment is concerned? Oh my golly. Uh, a lot of frustration. Uh, you know, we haven't, it seems, made the progress that we should have made with the federal government, with uh, Montreal, with the prop in terms of the techno park, the techno park lands. Uh, that's still in unresolved, and it's a disgrace that the city and all the, the superior levels of government haven't come to the help of this particular space. But there's a public outcry for it. There's a, a, a really a, a public pressure to get that space saved. And that's where democracy starts, in the public will. Now, you have brought this to the fore. I'm glad you did. Uh, what is the reason for the authorities at various levels of government, what is their reason for their apparent paralysis? It's a good question. It's a big question mark for us. Uh, the budget's there. Uh, the federal government has promised that they're going to create urban parks. Uh, we know about that. Uh, the city has committed itself uh, to doing conservation. It's got the Grand Park the last great, a, a, a fantastic project. But there are still these unresolved issues. So the city has the power. It, it could do it. Uh, with the help of the federal government, and it needs to be knocking the door to Quebec City as well. And we need to get uh, Montreal back uh, on a par with other major metropolitan areas across Canada. We're the poor cousins. You know, and uh, I don't know, you know, our spaces that are left, 
the natural spaces that have some intact biodiversity are no better off than the spaces that have been uh, partially developed or have been degraded in the past. You know, they're, it seems like one and the other are the same. They're treated in the same way. If it's got trees on it, if it's got wood on it, if it doesn't have a building on it, it's a waste. And that seems to be the mindset, uh, Patrick. You know, I think um, as far as the Green Coalition is concerned, all our member groups, uh, we've got a long road to you know, long road to hoe. I think yeah. we've got uh, still a lot uh, on the agenda uh, that we have to get sorted out, and we have to begin increasing the pressure. En el centro de la pampa vive un pimiento. En el centro de la pampa vive un pimiento. En el centro de la pampa vive un pimiento.